This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. This podcast is made in collaboration with The Jewish Journal. Check them out at jewishjournal.com. Also in collaboration with Arutz Sheva, israelnationalnews.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit 2njb.com slash donate. For many, during these times, it's all too easy to slip into hibernation after a steady diet of Netflix, while suffering existential angst, anxiety, and apathy. Anything beyond that can seem, well, just too hard. But let's face it, nothingness, doing nothing, simply breeds more nothingness. So it's no surprise that the nation that made the desert bloom has created a whole lot of some things out of this current COVID climate. Australian-born Israeli, Achi Kushner, could be considered your typical intelligent, driven Israeli. Yet, like most Israelis, there's nothing typical about Achi. Achi's volunteering has led him to discover the amazing grassroots initiatives everyday Israelis have developed in helping those affected by the coronavirus. We are thrilled to be joined today by Avi Kushner to talk Achi. about... Achi, sorry. Avi Did Kushner I... is the, the actor. Wait, have I been saying Avi No, you've been time? saying Achi. I've it's been okay, saying it happens Achi. a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wrote uh, Avi, that's why. Achi, okay. We're thrilled to be joined today. We would not be thrilled to be joined by Avi Kushner. Uh, I don't know. He's Speak also for yourself. Great. We are thrilled to be joined today by Achi Kushner to talk about his group Here for Good, volunteering and staying positive in these trying times. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, guys. I'm truly excited to be here in this awesome. beautiful setting. My first time having a podcast, so... It's one to remember. Nice, nice. And you're our, our first Australian, I think. No. Really? Yeah. I don't know. We were oh. just talking that you're 194, right? So it's hard to remember. But no, because maybe. we generally try not to bring Australians here. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Uh, we're just racist. Anyway, no. <laughs> no, I, I don't know if that. I, I find that hard to, to believe that you're first. Oh. But you know what? We're, we'll give you the title. First Australian on the podcast. Is it? It's a special. great honor. It sounds it sounds good. <laughs> Although I have I have to I have a disclaimer. I, I don't have the Australian accent, so I do apologize. So I have a little bit of it. Yeah, you do. Like a like residual Australian. Yeah, some leftovers. I think before when I came back to Israel, I had uh, my accent was a bit heavier, but uh, you know I was born in Australia and left when I was three and a half years old. Oh, really? Yeah, and um, my parents. Uh, I started to go to the kindergarten and I had no one to communicate with because I did here. that here and I didn't know any Hebrew. So they just spoke with me, Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew. Mm. I forgot my uh, Australian English. And then when I moved back, I started back, but it was not the same as speaking as a, as a native. So when did you move back to Australia? I moved back uh, in 2000, 2002, 2003. Yeah. Uh, so and and now you you're living again in Israel? Yeah. I had 10 years there. My plan was just to do my studies and come back. Every year I said next year I'm coming back, next year I'm coming back. I ended up staying there for for 10 and a half years and and when I moved back, people told me in Australia, uh, you know, I have a very I had a very I still have a very good Israeli friend there. He told me 3 4 5 months back in Israel, you'll be here with no time but i'm still here look <laughs> yeah it's, hard, it's uh, hard to leave nine years nine years had passed uh, actually so what prompted you to uh to start this here for good group and, well, and tell us a little bit about it also sure sure so uh i think what happened uh what happened during this crisis had been for me and and an amazing experience from a lot of different reasons uh uh Maybe it brings it back to Australia, basically, for perhaps for to to do with uh, my uh, life changing experience that brought me into uh, the world of giving, the magical cycle of giving, uh, and and that had pretty much shaped uh, who I am and the way I I look at life. Uh, so, 
When I graduated uh, at uh, Queensland University of Technology in Australia, uh, me and a colleague of mine, we, we saw a great opportunity. Uh, we were doing just our uh, practical experience in a private hospital and we saw a lot of uh, redundant medical equipment in very good condition. But private hospitals, they have a lot of money and budget to replace it. And it was just going to become surplus. And we thought together, what can we do? Uh, with with uh, with this equipment, how can we secure it and maybe give it to someone that could really make a good use of it? And just like that, on a we had a coffee and we started to roll the idea. Uh, and what happened later is is that we uh, we able to to form uh, basically an aid mission that was all about shif- uh, shipping this equipment to a, um, a very poor, neglected community in Papua New Guinea. And we able we were able to raise uh, funds for that. We basically formed our first job as professionals after uni uh, with this organization. And did you travel to Papua New Guinea? Yeah, yeah, we were there. Uh, we we basically did uh, a trip. It's an interesting to see. country. Oh yeah, uh, amazing country. It's the country that is uh, has the, the most, most detached country, right? Yeah, yeah. It was cannibalism was still practiced the last documented cannibalism was there but also it's it's just amazing because of the different species that the plants and species then and and really an unknown piece of land uh has more than 740 something spoken languages uh really diverse and, and 740 people also <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah wow. no they actually have tribes that are just literally Hundred meters from each other and speak a completely uh, different language. It's wow. it's just just amazing. The like not a different dialogue dialect, completely different. Yeah, yeah, completely. They have their their, their uh, official uh, uh, language, uh, which is a combination of English, German, and and and, and na- some uh, local native and English, and that that's it. They they have all the the rest of the dialects between wow. the. So what 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 was this organization? So so called? basically, uh, it was it was called MEMSI, Medical Aid Mission for Communities in Need, and that was the first time that uh, you know uh, I came across the fact that first of all, we're living in 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 a, some sort of a bubble, and the first time that you firsthand see this the condition and the situation, it's not the same when you see it on a movie, on a documentary movie, and when you actually see it firsthand on the ground. So that was a, a true uh, you know. It opened my mind. It really blasted my mind because I've realized two things. That uh, first of all, we have to value and appreciate what we have here, and the second, uh, uh, the second thing that it, it it doesn't take much to make a huge difference and an impact there. People there don't have very the very basic needs that we take for granted, like access for water, electricity, um, basic health services. Mm-hmm. So. We saw that by actually uh, delivering them very basic medical equipment that they can sustain, also, you know, teach them how to maintain and, and run this equipment, we can save, literally save uh, lives of, of people. And, and that, you know, that feeling is, is, is amazing because, uh, because not only it impacts the people that have a need, but also it changes you know, it changes uh, who you are and how you see this world and how you are more compassionate and, uh, and empathic to others. And not only that, the fact that you can bring more people. We brought delegations of students, actually, from the university on the second leg. And you see how young people at a very young age, before they start the, the race rat, they, they actually look at this, experience that, and it changes them as well. So... This was the first time that I actually realized that it's not only a huge impact to those who receive the help, but it's also maybe even greater impact to the people who have the opportunity and the chance to experience something like that. Because to witness it, will, it. Yes, because it will take them to a complete different path in their life. Uh, you know, today we have expectations from society, get a job find a wife, start a family, and you run into, you know... Moreover, today, like, when you tell me about... When you think about entrepreneurship, you think about money-making, like, and and uh, the concept of social entrepreneurship deserves so much more attention, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what happens is, uh, you know, people realize at the end of their life, you know, they, they say, ask themselves, so, okay, 
what did I do to, to leave a mark here? Is there something I can do? And it's, be it's better later than never, but then, you know, they give some of their assets or they, they volunteer and they donate money, which is great, but what would have happened if that had started in, in early in your life? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what impact and what path you would have uh, left behind uh, if you did that. So that was the first time for me that I've, I've realized uh, that sharing the experience, uh, I think that it, it exists in each and every one of us. It's just not every one of us is lucky enough to be in the circumstances and to expose uh, you know, get the exposure for, for things like that. So for me, it was a true uh, um, life-changing experience that really uh, shifted shifted the way I, I, I looked at volunteering. I think and a plane is about to, like, crash into the apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good sign that planes are starting to yeah. uh, fly again. It literally sounds like it's just about to <laughs> fly through your window. <laughs> well, well <laughs> hopefully we... not. Um okay so so but did you ever have the opportunity to uh m like I'm assuming yes but to actually meet the people that you're bringing this equipment yeah, that this yeah. equipment was influencing Yes we we had a, an amazing local partner there that was you know one of the reasons why we decided initially we thought to go to India but because we we formed this uh uh, this great friendship and partnership with uh, with the local organization there in a in a very remote uh, uh, province, and we we actually came and we lived like the local people there uh, for for one week. So which you means you ate their friends. <laughs> 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 you were actually your diet was very basic, just fruits, papaya, uh, you know, uh, mango. Uh, very basic stuff. The people there were just naked. They did an amazing ceremony for us. Did you have to be naked? No. Okay. <laughs> but uh, didn't, he didn't have to be. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you would be so weird. Like everybody's naked and you would, like wear something and they laugh at you. Look at you. Yeah, they it's, probably see like yeah, you the as a complete world. outsider. Oh, right? oh yeah. Be no. Because we, we're not in the city. We're in the, in the rural setting. So first of all, they see a white guy. And... My friend, the, my co-founder, Taiwan Kong, is an Asian dude. And then they <laughs> see a white guy, an Asian dude. They were just, they didn't understand where we came from. <laughs> and, and these people, you need to understand, was back in, in 2007. But they also, they, they don't know what is a plane, what is a train. Uh, it's, it's like, in a way, it's fascinating to, 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 to live with them for one week and see, you know... They, they they basically they build their own houses from from trees and and very basic life but at the same time very happy people you know if someone needs uh, to give birth and she needs to walk three days to get a medication or to get treatment and by the end of these three days she might not make it okay that's life and and you know and if they someone is sick and they need to go to the closest eight posts which is also two days and they have to wait outside until a doctor will arrive and and in the end they don't get the medication at the end they they, they cannot help the people back in the village they don't complain here you go to kupat Cholim, someone just passed uh, before you and you start to shout and and you know make a lot of noise <laughs> and, and look at the differences there so in a way they they don't have much but they they also they don't complain and 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 they are happy with what they have and they accept uh the, their sort of life so the whole, uh, I remember, the whole experience was just sensational from, from a cultural point of view, but also from a point of view of, of, uh, of how you can really uh, improve their life. I think that they have a, a very big problem that they have, apart from, from malaria and contamination of, of water sources, but also uh, when the women, there they, they give birth, there is something very basic, a suction pump that needs to they need to suck their blood uh from the lungs sometimes that, that they can choke and die infants die from that and that's a very basic equipment that they don't have and if they had it the, you know the mortality rate of of uh you know young toddlers would have been just uh, completely different and this is a life-saving very wow. basic equipment and and the fact that it's there the fact that they uh the basically our idea was to place the equipment that we brought uh containers of equipment in um, aid post and also set up a health center that will serve the, the entire area so they don't have to go very large distances by foot mm -hmm. and 
and that's not something huge, you know. This is the surplus equipment that is going to be... But it's huge for them. It's huge for them. And, and you know, at one point, you are so sad to see their conditions and, and the way they are living. They don't have water. They don't have electricity, mobile phones, all of that sort of stuff. But at the same time, it gives you so much hope because you need... You, you understand? Hey, I don't need to... It's not... Uh, it's not something too complicated to, to... I mean, you can watch survival and come to the same conclusion. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just got addicted to the survival here in Israel. So. Survivor. 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 Yeah, survivor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like Papua New Guinea. Yeah. It's basically the same. <laughs> um, but it's, I, I think there's also a difficulty when providing uh, assistance and aid in, 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 like you did probably to make it sustainable meaning to provide the help is one thing but to be able to leave and kind of have the help survive on its own is another thing is there were you able to overcome that because that's a huge challenge absolutely absolutely and and i've seen that before down the track i've been to you know uh, other places and and I was just recently, uh, you know, in, in the end of 2018 in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and and that's the thing, sustainability and, and also knowledge transfer. Over there, they get donations of equipment like a microscope. It, it's huge if they can have do. Um, I'm working now in, in, in a medical device in ophthalmology. Uh, so, so surgeries. Uh, for basically to repair vision and, and things like that. So if they have access to a microscope, this is huge. It can really improve uh, the, the services that they can provide to the local people. But you see something simple like a light bulb that needed to be replaced in the microscope. That's it. And just because of their mentality, because of, you know, no one thought that, you know, it's the, the problem with the light bulb and it sits there, a microscope that is worth a fortune and they're not using it. Uh, and 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 other examples, you know, I was there with diagnostic equipment, and it was, it was given, a, it was provided as a donation from Germany. So in Congo they speak French, and the, the basically the user interface is in German. All you need to do is change the setting to French, but no one was there to do it. They, you know, again, wow. they, they're not thinking a little bit outside of the box. And you have such a, a worthwhile equipment, but. Something simple like that puts it as a, as a white elephant. So this is a very a very true point, and and this is why we thought about really basic equipment that the maintenance does not require much, and it's not enough to give them the the equipment. We also this is where we also got the students involved. We were doing um, workshops of how to maintain it and and the basic routine uh, maintenance and management of this equipment. So there would be a, a sustainable aspect to it. This is one of the, the biggest challenges that you have with aid, that you are just uh, you know giving them the, the fish and in the end if they yeah. don't know you how need to longevity fish, to the longevity to the initiative. yeah sustainability and and also. You know, I've seen it now with uh, with ophthalmologists that they go there. They don't just go and do surgeries that 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 save the vision of of children or of elderly people. They go and they teach local surgeons the new techniques in medicine. They bring uh, doctors to get trained in Switzerland, in in the U.S. So they will bring the knowledge back there. Uh, so the NGO that you formed still exists. You went to the Congo of the same. NGO? No, 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 that that was already uh, past that. What happened was that we, we worked on this um, basically uh, for a year and a half. It was it was amazing time, but uh, the financial crisis came because we, we were just mm. basically we managed to get in kind support and funds for uh, a quarter of a million uh, Australian dollars to, to get the operation running uh, in terms of the logistics. We, we you know, we were working on a on a part-time both of us uh and then you know came the financial crisis mm -hmm. money started to disappear they cut first thing they cut is is for things like that and and the first stage was completed the second stage was completed the third stage was about actually setting up the health center we received a a building that was deserted and a space and a land that was actually going to be a, a whole health center that that was that was our aim and it was tough, you know. We, we 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 saw the vision. We saw what we can do further with that. Our idea was basically to set up to duplicate that to other places and get also academic institutions involved. So they actually, instead of you doing a practical uh, placement in a hospital like we did, most of the time you do, you know, 
not not the you know the real stuff uh, mm -hmm. you actually will do something really meaningful during your, your practical placement and not just in medical engineering in IT in medicine and we offered this program to, to the university and this is where we saw this could go so you will have a campus for the university in a third world country where students actually get their practical experience in the in the real world not in mm -hmm. our own bubble so um but then obviously the crisis put an end to this unfortunately yes, yes. i'm still missing something because you said um you went to uh you you went to papua new guinea but before that well, the thing that prompted to you you to do it was that you were sitting with your friend and this all this medical supplies were about to go to waste and you guys just kind of were having a coffee but i'm wondering before i want to move on to, to the COVID. to yeah. uh to COVID and to uh, here for good and talk about that. But before I want to, I want to understand what like drives you, where did that start? Where did this like, like, why did you decide that you're, that you need even need to, most people would sit and have a coffee with a friend, talk about it and do nothing. So like what pushed you to actually do this and why is it important? I think specifically there was just, you know, realizing this is this is such a waste for no reason you know it's a whole warehouse with so much equipment and it's not that they are you know selling it or, or mm -hmm. something like that it's just sitting there and it's going to go and it's going to be actually a problem for the environment and, and just because you know no one is willing to make an effort or think outside a box outside of the box or no one wants to get the uh, you know the hassle to deal with it so did you ever have that experience that you're describing where you witnessed kind of this giving happening and that kind of influenced you or did it just kind of was it always like that that you just it was clear to you that you know giving is something that needs to be done yeah i think uh, i think maybe prior to that i think that uh uh, what struck me to 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 feel close to trying to solve problems or or or, or to be more sensitive to people in need is uh, perhaps my service in the in the Israeli ambulance services. So you know the the feeling when you're giving someone who is in desperate need and there's no one there to help him if it's not you. Perhaps that that was something that uh, helped me. That, that was really a, a prominent experience. That you know when you bring someone back to life. And you realize if you were not there, maybe this person, you know, wasn't here today. So you realize, you know, there are people that definitely this could make a difference. This could change their lives. And, and you know, we, we shouldn't just sit here and have a look at it and continue uh, with what we do. We have to, we have to find a way, uh, basically something that could be possible to do about it. But at that time, we didn't realize it will get into the... Uh, this this dimension we you know it just started to roll we're just talking about it and then we talked to the management of the hospital we talked about the university we giving us a hand engineers without borders rotary club and you know from here to there mm -hmm. it all uh, it came it all into existence yeah yeah so let's talk a bit about uh about today where where you are today and covid where did yeah. covid hit this, you yeah how did yeah, it start yeah. the covid uh, uh okay, initiative well, well uh, to be honest, uh, along the years, I, 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 it was something very close to my heart. So I always was was involved in in giving, but also in trying to to see and find ways how more people can get into this cycle. Because I believe it's just a matter of circumstances. If the person cannot come to the circumstances, you need to bring the circumstances to the person. So over the years, I had a lot of experiences overseas and also here in Israel, community work. And we just started to form uh, the Here for Good a month before. You know, uh, childhood friends of mine uh, that we are all together, you know, we are like-minded people. We, we think about how can we do something good? How can we get more people into this cycle of giving? So we were sitting together. To be honest, we went in touch for many years. It was like a reunion. Uh, a good friend of mine who is in, in you know, he's uh, a scripter, a uh, filmmaking, and, and uh, another uh, good friend, childhood friend who is uh, uh, working as a you know background in psychology and and he's a coacher. And we were sitting together and, and thinking, you know, um, let's do something that will actually 
help people to realize what they are missing out on and, and how beneficial it is to them. And we started to form this, this basic, basically the idea and how we're going to do it. And we decided, okay, we're going to go to, to social media and, and we'll start to, uh, you know, find really interesting stories and document them and also document not just, okay, this is an organization that does X or Y, but actually, you know, document what I do, mm-hmm. what it, how it affects me and how it affects the person who receives the help. And this is how it started to roll. And that was just, you know, a month before COVID-19. And, and we were not sure, you know, how people will accept it and, and if there's a space for that. But we realized that we want to do something really fun, entertaining, uh, showing positive sides, showing positiveness, and also show how it affects the people to inspire them. Uh, and then uh, our first episode was with, uh, do you know how they called? I forgot how they are called. Um, Give us a hint. Uh, TV show, radio. Oh, sh- shiza. Uh The guys that save food and they serve it ah, in a restaurant. Yeah. Leket. No, Leket is, is all. Is, is, is um, uh, Amutat Chom. No, shit. They, uh, I forgot. Oh, okay, it's uh, okay. We'll put listen, links. It's, we'll put yeah, links to that. Put the links. It's an inspirational American guy that basically is saving here in Israel. Here in Israel, he's saving food from the markets oh, just because they are the ugly. Podcast. Yeah. Oh, actually, a really warm recommendation. Okay. So yes. you'll you'll hook us up. Absolutely. When you remember who he is and where he works. If he watches this, <laughs> I'm done. I'm doomed. Uh, how are they called? Friends okay. of Yad Salah. No. <laughs> no. No. We're going to find boxes, <laughs> food boxes, and a Yad Eliezer. No, 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 no. Anyway, okay. Let anyway, it will come. Let it? No. It anyway, will come to you. Anyway, this dude is, is, is saving food. Okay. From the market in Haifa. And he's got a chef and a restaurant that they use the food that is just because it's ugly and, and you cannot sell it. Uh, it's a vegetarian restaurant and they serve it to whoever wants if you have money, you pay as much as you think it was worth. If you don't have money, no problem. You can also pay. And everyone there are volunteers, you know, tourists who come, people volunteer as as um, as waiters uh, and really, truly, truly incredible story. So we came there. We started filming at three Robin o'clock food. in the morning. Robin food. Gosh. Boom. Nice. <laughs> This is the age, you know, I'm yeah, starting yeah, to yeah. get old. Wow. So, uh, Robin food. Robin food. What's wrong with me? If only you had access to the proper medication. I know. And then <laughs> for the memory. <laughs> exactly. So Robin food. So we had an amazing time. We started the picking at 6 a.m., picking off the food, you know, from, from the ground, just because it's ugly and no one will buy it. And we brought it to the restaurant and, and, you know, they have their routine. The chef is telling them what he feels like cooking today. So bring a lot of potatoes, bring a lot of celery, whatever. And then th- th- it's like uh, the chef is just whatever. He doesn't know what will happen. He's making the, uh, the meals and then people are coming and being served. And the whole concept here is incredible because awareness for not wasting food. First of all, people buy so much stuff that they don't need. You don't go to do shopping and you don't know what you have in your fridge and, and, and at home and, and you buy stuff and, and you throw it away. Same time, it's also food that they're making uh, meals and people can eat whether you're from the street or not. So the whole concept was incredible. So we did the filming, the whole thing, uh, and we said, wow, this is we've got here good stuff. And, and we've, uh, we filmed and documented it as if we are part of the organization and what it does to us. And and of obviously, we uh, interviewed the guy and the people there, so it was fantastic. But we never knew, okay, when we edit it and when we put it out, how people will accept it. And then came COVID nineteen, and put everything on hold. So you know you can't get out of your house, and we're thinking already we had the second uh, episode, and uh, we we even had the second episode. We had we had another one coming up, and and. Uh, and, you know, l- like most of us, you know, I was on Khalat, finding myself at home mm-hmm. um, and, you know, not knowing really what to do. And then, you know, slowly they start to put more restrictions and then slowly people, uh, you know, th- there is a lot of co- a lot of conversations on, on WhatsApp, on Facebook and and people are wanting, you know, lifting their hand to, to do good. And you see uh, suddenly there's 
greater needs are, are becoming now more and more apparent not just you know people that needed help before but even now all the elderly population for example all the vulnerable populations and and for me it, it, it was just incredible to see how from nothing you know people are coming with initiatives uh, people raising their hands and and i started just to pick up everything from facebook from whatsapp messages uh and, and i started to see okay what's what's happening now and suddenly uh you know even myself sitting at home starting to look at the ceiling not knowing what to do i started to have a routine i i started to wake up i said today i'm going to this volunteer work today i'm going with that organization and then i realized whoa uh, okay it's good that i'm volunteering it has you know it's beneficial for the for, for people who need the help but why not you know get the whole concept of here for good and document it and hand it over to other people now that they have a lot of spare time uh you know and and try to move them to do good and and this was this was also a really good uh, test for us to see that if our idea and concept can work mm -hmm. And, and what what happened was was really uh, was really incredible. It just started from from me sitting at home and just filming myself, uh, sharing the experience of being at home, not knowing what to do with myself, but just taking the initiative, calling friends of mine who know people who are alone, elderly people who might need a help, and I was just doing a round of calls to five people. And just to talk to them just to talk to them hi i'm achi i know you from here you are the cousin of my mother uh, i just you know i know that now it's a difficult time how are you coping with everything uh, is there anything i can help you with food medication do you know someone at your age neighbor friend that might need a help and and it was amazing because first of all it truly touched them that someone who is not a me uh, like an immediate family member actually cared about them and mm -hmm. is calling to and asking how they are uh, and you see how it lifted their spirit and how thankful they were and some of them needed help and i said well you know you don't need to go to papua new guinea you don't need to, to, to go to Co this is something so simple you're sitting at home and look how it made me feel the day looked completely different to me because you feel that you did something meaningful you actually these people you know they, they were truly vulnerable they don't know how much years they got to leave. And now when this whole thing of COVID is, is, is also going, they, they're scared, you know, mm -hmm. even more scared, more depressed, more alone. So something simple like that, I published it. And you, know, you, would, you would film yourself having these phone calls and then publish it. I, I, I actually filmed, yeah, a, a, a few phone calls. And, uh, what and were it, the reactions? And, and uh, you know, and, and people, I got people telling me, you know, thank you so much for this. I made phone calls myself. I made a list myself. You know, this is so simple to do. I, I myself don't know what to do with the time. You know, someone told me, you know, I, I went up to my neighbor and looked if she's okay. Because up until now, it was just an old person who lives above me. But suddenly, it, it got a different meaning. And, and, and you know, so, so uh, I think that the experience of when the combination of using social media doing something very simple but very rewarding and um and make it uh, making it accessible so you're not just saying hey look i'm such a great person look what i'm doing you're just also giving them the recipe what you need to do uh was showing was really proving itself as, as something that is making an impact before because before covid 19 i had previous experiences in, in trying to you know inspire people and 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 get people on board it's tough it's difficult mm -hmm. you know i, I had a community-based project with a, a friend of mine feeding homeless people and making people uh, cook another meal to the dinner in tel aviv to feed the homeless people it was great reaction but but you know it took time we wanted to get more and more people on board it was difficult and here suddenly Mm -hmm. Like fire, it's spread. like fire. We were talking about getting an like app. an infectious disease, <laughs> it, yeah. like like the COVID. It, it was exponential, like the COVID that was yeah. started. It was exponential in terms of people who got involved, and and you know there was a guy, uh, Adam Le Adam. His his whole uh, online uh, ticket purchasing went down the drain, and he decided, okay, with my knowledge, I'm gonna build an app, and he 
and he just uh, built it, uh, he had an app that just connects geographically people with a need to people who want to help so we just get online type i want to help and then you see 500 meters from you someone needs medication and, and connect the wow. dots so suddenly it's becoming you know the use of technology and also basic technology whatsapp groups for example something that really evolved and and you know with all the difficulties and struggle that i was having with my friend uh, Jonathan back at those uh, times suddenly it's it's everywhere and it's contagious uh, so so it started with that and then i realized you know there's more stuff to do i'm going to go to 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 volunteer and do other things and and also you know put it out there for for people to to have ideas to to understand how they can do it mm -hmm. uh, it's it's it was a really unique time in history that people confined to their space out of work so much time available the other hand so many people vulnerable need help uh, so you know 25 percent of people that were in halat or unemployed came to volunteer this is a huge number um, People Do you have numbers on the people who participated in your initiative? An estimation? One, one, uh, one organization, uh, we, uh, we, we did a documentation of, of a WhatsApp group that is based on your location and how simple it is to just uh, get a call. So it was, it's like a taxi, you know, I felt like a taxi driver. I need for Rehov Schenkel 55, who's available? And you also, there's a lot of activity. So you go, you, you go and see the different calls and, and you take a call and I just show them, okay, anyway, I'm going to buy some food. I need food. I'm going to buy this person also food. Give him a call. Does he need anything else? Medication? Okay. The pharmacy is next door. So it's not something really a big effort for me. And then documenting the fact that he received it and... How thankful he was because think about you so know, you ask people to document themselves as they do this. some people did and sent okay. it to me but i just d documented that and and again handed it over to the people and uh, and i got basically the, the name of the organization and then you know 55 volunteers came to their uh, new uh, who saw that came to the organization from that number a lot of people said thanks for that video i actually today delivered medications i delivered food so you know it's it's such it's an amazing. amazing feeling i i think it's nice to mention like just so the listeners understand some of the israeli mentality um in another field um driving and getting stuck on the roadside so just as an anecdote there's this organization here in Israel, I, I also mm -hmm. again I don't I, I don't remember wh how uh, what's their name. Ch friends on the road. Yeah, or friends like of that. the road. Again, yeah. Yeah. And these it's a ban bunch of people with no like they organized by themselves, not unlike your your initiative, in in a WhatsApp group or whatever they formed an app or a, a, a phone number I don't know even. So if you get stuck on the road. Um, you just call this number, and they—it's like ways. They have people all it's over like the place. It's like AAA for free. Yeah, it's basically yeah. roadside yeah. yeah. assistance. For so free. if someone from this uh, brotherhood yeah. and sisterhood um, get is nearby, he just comes by and helps you to fix your car. Yeah. Or if you're stuck without fuel, he'll come and ref refuel your car, and yeah. So and th this is, uh, I think that people are involved with that. They, the reason why they will continue to do it again and again, it's it's also because something happens to you when you when you are involved in this sort of activity, you know. Uh, also ph physiologically, you know, research uh, uh, there are a lot of studies that showing that you know there is a release of endorphins, uh, oxytocin, dopamine. It actually makes you feel good. It actually improves also your, your well-being. There are studies that are showing that your immune system gets better. So this is this is not at the core of why people want to help, but it, it is in a way contagious. Why do doctors repeatedly, they take their, their leave, annual leave, and go to Africa to volunteer there? They are feeling, you know, fulfillment. They are feeling that they are doing something with a true meaning. And also, there's something, they call it a helper's high. When you're doing something good and helping someone without expecting anything in return, the sensation and the feeling is is incredible and 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 it is contagious it's like a drug you do it once 
you want to do it again and again and again uh, and, and and this is also an important message for 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 people who want to get involved with that apart from the fact that it's meaningful it adds it, it gives you a, you know a sense of, of purpose it makes you feel good it's actually healthy you mm-hmm. know it's people also they tell people who are doing it on a regular basis uh, it it improves also your, your mental uh, state mental well-being uh, so like people like a doctor tells you go do exercise be- to improve your health you know I think people should go and volunteer to also to, to get the benefit rip the benefits from from doing this sort of work uh, you saw uh, you know the the lady the 92 years old, old uh, lady who was in the Independence Day with um, yes know, leading the torch yes yeah you know I think it was incredible she's doing 18 years of, of volunteer work, and she said you know why I'm happy you know why I look like this I volunteer on a re- it really, it really makes people happy, with a purpose, healthier. Uh, it's, it's something you know. It's something that science tells you. It's, it's not just you know, me telling you here, trying to convince you. There's a sci- scientific proof behind it. So, w- what's next for uh, here for good? So, uh, yeah. So, so, so basically, we, uh, you know, it, it gave us a real boost. Uh, all this experience that we we had, and and we're basically now, um, the idea is is to continue with with the message of of showing, organization putting a projector on on uh, organization that are doing good, and sharing the experience of giving, mm-hmm. and by doing that, you know, I think something really uh, unique happened here. During the COVID nineteen, people became more sensitive, more empathic. I think this is a really. Uh, it showed us that there is a really, uh, there's space for that, and there's room uh, to show that and keep that on the agenda. People are now slowly getting back to the routine life, mm-hmm. but we want this uh, movement that started to stay. And and apart from that, even though people now are getting back to their to their life they had before slowly. Uh, still, you know, because of what has had happened, I hear beautiful stories about friendship that were formed b- between, you know, young people and elderly that they are still in touch. That in a way adopted elderly people, uh, friendship between between uh, neighbors. People are much more aware now. So so uh, so we are we basically are here to continue what we wanted to do with Robin Food. Just COVID nineteen gave us a really uh, big boost. And and you know we're starting now uh, now to to film and and we're gonna get a, a pile of chapters and we're gonna do like a series on social uh, on on social media. Too. How can people tune in? Uh, basically, we we're gonna have a, a YouTube channel and a Facebook uh, and Instagram. This is where we we're gonna be present and, and just join uh, here for good. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's still it's just under construction as as we speak, but but uh, but at the meantime, you can search me on Facebook to see some of our videos and how the concept had started. Achi uh, Kushner is A C H I yeah K U S H N I R N I R exactly, uh, and uh, and and yeah, we we believe that it had it has great potential, and it is here for good. Mm-hmm. Also, forever, people will want to do good and and help others and and uh, and also I think there's there's a there is a ro- need for that and a room f- space for that. I stopped watching the news. You know, you see just dreadful things there: politics, rubbish, murder. Uh, you 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 need to you know you need to free your mind. Yeah, to see something. Why they don't give the stage? to good things that are happening in, in our in our society. You know, one of the organizations we have visited called Levechad, it's basically a, an organization that is usually formed just in emergency uh, situations like we had now. And it's all formed by young people, youth. Uh, you know, youth, uh, people before the army in Shnat Sherut. Uh, and for me, it was just truly inspirational to see the quality of, of our uh, the young generation here mm-hmm. and how they care and how they come with initiatives. They were telling me about other stuff that they are going to get involved now. And, you know, you hear on the news of the things that happen in Napa Island and all bad stuff about about what young people are doing here. Mm-hmm. And it's not really balanced. And there are beautiful things here that need to be heard and need to get uh, the stage. It's a good thing you didn't open the New York Times today. Did you see what the cover of the New York Times was? 
It was the deaths. A, yeah. It was like 100,000. The, the headline was 100,000 lost in the U.S. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. it was just like a list of all the names, which, you know, uh, it's nice to honor them. But, yeah, it's not a it's not exactly good news. Yeah. Front yeah. page good well, news. Yeah. Well, if you live in America right now, there's no much room for good news, I guess. Uh, there's always room for good news. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well. it's it's just it's also us as consumers. We we need to dictate what is important to us and what we we want to watch. You know, if the yeah. main uh, news outlets understand that this is not going to give them bring them rating, it's a fine line though, right? Because you don't want to ignore the bad, but on the other hand, you want to you want to focus on the good. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you need yeah, you need to acknowledge that. And some some bad news are important to increase awareness to, you know, to put pressure on the decision makers. But but can't have everything uh you know 90 to 10 the percentage is should be balanced mm-hmm. um fair media is what we need yeah well yeah, yeah. good luck <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much for coming Achi. thank it was you really it's inspiring really beautiful. insightful we uh, feel so pointless after <laughs> Hearing Speak your yourself, endeavors, man. No, I'm speaking for you mainly. Okay, actually. Okay, yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> no, that's no, accurate. I think each and every one of us can do. The fact that you are um, giving a voice to to doing good is something great. Oh, you okay. Know? Yeah. Anyone, so we that. did our share. <laughs> oh yeah, that's absolutely. It. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know? no, no. So how can how can people actually get in touch to be part of the giving uh, if they want to? Is there is there an opportunity to do that to maybe get in touch with you and participate in the volunteering? Sending yeah. films or yeah, yeah. The 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 i the idea basically is, is uh, after every uh, documentary that we have, we give them also like I said when you hand over the the recipe and how to do it. So we give the information of how to uh, volunteer, who to get in contact with, and also what you say now is is truly important. The, the power of social media uh, is is it, it makes it really contagious. So when I help someone, but I shared the news and someone else saw it and then decided also to help mm-hmm. and also share the news. This is how it becomes, you know, energy builds energy. Mm-hmm. And we saw it also now that people are posting on Instagram. And, and you know, if you are not only doing something good, you're also sharing it with the world. You are actually spreading. You're on Instagram? Yeah, yeah. I'm on okay. Instagram too. Cool. So guys, look out for Achi Kushner and also uh, stay tuned for Here for Good. Um, uh, coming soon. Um, soon. Before we, we head out, we do have a couple of things we'd like to mention. One, we have a sponsorship with the Jewish Journal, a collaboration, collaboration. with the Jewish Journal. Uh, you guys can find them at jewishjournal.com. They have great content, great podcasts. Uh, David Suisa, Shmuel Rosner, two nice Jewish boys. So check them out, jewishjournal.com. And also we collaborate with Arutz Sheva. You can find them at israelnationalnews.com. And if you want to stay uh, updated with what's going on here in Israel. It's a great place to go to. So check them out at um, israelnationalnews.com. We switched it up this week. It's yeah. like challenging. Yeah. Uh, also, and, yeah, and we uh, we do this on our free time, guys. So if you uh, want to do wanna good, help, if you want to help us out, then uh, 2njb.com slash donate. But, uh, you know, better to throw your uh, hard money not both? At, at charity. Why not? Because I always like we can't we can't ask for money at the end of an episode like Why? this. <laughs> we also need to. <laughs> There's people. We need food. Dying in Papua New Guinea, and like we're gonna ask people for money. Okay, fine. You can donate. <laughs> Two yeah, yeah. slash donate. This is also the voice uh, for good uh, deeds. So. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Approved by Achi Kush. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank good you luck. so much. Thanks, guys, for listening. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.